I'd like to call to order the September 17th, 2024 meeting of the Las Virginas Malibu Council of Governments Governing Board. Will the executive director please call roll? Aniko Gold. Aye. Here. Paul Grisanti. Doug Stewart. Here. Kelly Honig. Here. Penny Sylvester. Here. President Weintraub. Here. We have a quorum. Thanks, Terry. Now we're going to move ahead to approval of the agenda. Does anyone have any changes to the agenda? If not, can I have a motion to approve the agenda? Um, Penny Sylvester makes a motion to approve the agenda. Doug Stewart seconds. Will the executive director please call roll? Aniko Gold. Aye. Doug Stewart. Aye. Kelly Honig. Aye. Penny Sylvester. Aye. President Gold. President Weintraub. Aye. Are there any members of the public who would like to address the governing board? Terry, have you received any public comments? Have not. Okay, since we have no public comments, we will go on to item number four, our consent calendar. Consent calendar items will be approved in one motion unless removed for separate discussion or action. Would anyone like to remove an item from the consent calendar? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent calendar? I move to approve the consent calendar. I'll second. Will the executive director please call roll? Aniko Gold. Aye. Doug Stewart. Paul Grisanti is now on board. Oh, Let him Paul Grisanti. Aye. Kelly Honig. Aye. Penny Sylvester. Aye. President Weintraub. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Now we are moving on to information items. We're going to start with an SCE discussion on outage notification and the SCE business process improvement. Oh, we're, we're going to, uh, sorry, the SCE discussion on outage notification update. And who is giving that presentation today? Uh, my colleague, uh, Luis Lara, who's been okay, Louis. Who's been okay. perfect. Turn it over to you. Good morning. Um, now, I'm just wondering, is was someone going to project the presentation? You, sh you should have screen sharing, I believe. Got it. My apologies for that. No problem. Uh, bear with me one second, because um, Zoom is not a system that we utilize. So let me let me bring this over here and let's do it this way. There we go. If I can feel the vicious moment, Luis has been with uh, Edison over 15 years. He works in our business um, uh, outage communication. And since the presentation is up, I can stop feeling the moment. Back to you, Luis. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. So uh, first of all, yes, so my name is Luis Lada. I'm with the Outage Management and Communications team. And uh, part of my responsibility and role within Edison is to engage our major customers and government customers in all things outage related. Anything from a repair or an unplanned outage event, maintenance outage, PSPS, you name it. So our team is, is part of that uh, support structure that lends that, that uh, additional information to, to you. Um, so. I'll stop talking, uh, but before I get into it, uh, let me just say this is part of a long, larger presentation. Uh, it's really about 8,000 slides, totally kidding. But if you need something like this that, that would benefit your staff, that may benefit your constituents, please reach out and let us know. We can come out into your community and have this type of conversation with them and really kind of um, pull back the veil on what happens behind the scenes while Edison performs maintenance outages or repair unplanned outage events. So just want to throw that out there. So let's go ahead and jump into it. So our outages primarily fall into maybe four, four or five categories our customers may experience. Our maintenance outage, for example. 
maintenance. Maintenance outages are just that, right? We know the types of outages that are going to happen. We know what maintenance we're going to perform out in the field, whether it's a pole replacement, transformer replacement. Because it's a maintenance, we know the scope of work that, that is going to occur. We know which customers are going to be de-energized. De and because of that, we're able to push out notifications well in advance to that customer base. A repair outage, also known as an unplanned outage uh, event, is really like a good example of that could be when a, a, a big rig hits a pole, right? A car hits a pole. Uh, we actually know it as a CHP. Uh, so when a car hits a pole, it's an unplanned event. We don't have advance notice of when things like that will happen. Uh, but when they do, uh, there is a process for en engaging our customers, letting them know what's happening and keep them up, up to date. And I'll get into that in a few more slides. An emergency operation uh, could be uh, we're doing an inspection out in the field and uh, Troublement finds that there's a leaking transformer. In that instance, we'll begin to uh, work on re repairing that leaking transformer, replacing it right away. So in other words, it presents an emergency hazard to the public, so we need to replace that right away. In that instance, so it's kind of like a quasi-maintenance, quasi-repair outage, kind of in that gray zone. We know the project that has to happen, but because of the urgency for public safety, we really don't have the luxury to push out notifications to those customers. It just has to be done right away. Our public safety, our PSPS uh, events, those are ongoing. We're in the midst of, of it. In fact, last night we just concluded uh, PSPS activation. Um, so those are ongoing. Many of you are well aware of that. Uh, I won't get into, into, too, into too much detail on it today, but if you need that, we can definitely do that. Uh, another type of outage that our customers may experience is the public agency outage. Now, this happens when there's an active fire somewhere and the fire department reaches out to Edison and says, hey, guys, we need you to shut off these lines. We have crews going into that area. We're performing some kind of uh, mitigation efforts there. So de-energize ASAP. Again, we don't have the luxury to send out to push out notifications to customers. It just has to happen because of what's happening uh, in, during a live act uh, fire. <clears throat> Now, our maintenance outage process is, is really simple and it really has morphed over the last probably four or five years pretty uh, a lot, actually. Uh, one thing that we're looking to do when we do a maintenance outage, number one, we're looking to reduce the number of customers that are impacted. How can we reduce, reduce that impact uh, footprint to the smallest footprint possible? Another thing that we're looking at is how do we reduce the duration of that outage? Also, if we're going to perform an outage on Acme Community, for example, is there other work that we need to do in that community and can we bundle that work? Uh, one thing that we've identified and heard from our uh, customers is that, you know what, we're receiving too many outages. You're here too much. Love you, don't come so much, right? So in that instance, we're looking at opportunities to bundle work. So if we can do a pull replacement, can we also do a transformer replacement, a gas switch replacement? What else can we do within that scope of work uh, and that duration, outage duration uh, to really maximize our, our time in that community? Again, we want to reduce what's, what we're identifying as outage fatigue, right? Now, our outages are uploaded into our system about 13 to 15 days in advance of the outage actually happen. Uh, so what that means is that we'll trigger notifications to, to customers at approximately 10 to 11 days in advance. Now, we are always encouraging customers to sign up for digital notifications, and that's uh, email, voice message, and text. The reason for that is because their digital notifications were able to push out notifications quickly and provide updates as the uh, outage, maintenance outage or repair outage continues to evolve. So again, if you can help us push that uh, information to your constituency, uh, sign up for digital notifications and while you're at it, update contact information. So that's, you're going to hear that from me a couple of times today. Uh, from your own organ organization, your own operations to your constituency, please help us spread the mes message, update contact information. It invariably doesn't fail every time there's an outage, whether it's maintenance or repair. We push out notifications, including for emergency outages, where we push out the notification and notification comes back as undelivered because customers haven't updated contact information. And I get it. It makes complete sense, right? No one really thinks about Edison, whether when they're getting a new phone number or changing a mobile device or whatever it is, right? People really think about Edison on two occasions, when you go to flip the light switch and the light doesn't come on or when you have to pay the bill. And in both instances, they're not the best interactions with SEE. So if you can help us pass the word, please update contact information, including for your own operations. That would help us tremendously. Okay. Now for our repair process, right? What happens behind the scenes when we have a repair or unplanned outage event? Now our circuits are built and really split in half, right? There's a front half and there's a rear half. If a fault happens, let's say a car hit a pole, which is one of the most common ones, 
car hits a pole, the system will automatically start, start testing itself within the first 30 seconds of the outage having begun. If we're able to keep power on on the front half, then we know that the fault is located on the rear half of the circuit. In that instance, we'll isolate that rear half and begin working to narrow that, that scope or that outage footprint even further, okay? Now, here's a really good rule of thumb that I want you guys to write somewhere and uh, because I know your constituents are going to reach out to you and ask you for more information. So let's say there's an outage, unplanned event, and it impacts a community. The first thing they're going to do is reach out to you. Hey, do you know what's happening? How soon am I going to get my power restored? So a good rule of thumb is most customers are going to have their power restored within the first 90 minutes of an unplanned event happening. That's 90 minutes. Okay, and I'll get into more detail on what happens in those 90 minutes. But give us about 90 minutes after that. We like, more likely than not have already narrowed the, the fault footprint. Uh, to the smallest footprint possible, and only those customers that have to be or have to remain de-energized because of the fault uh, at location, they will remain for the remainder of uh, they will remain de-energized for the remainder of the reparations, okay, or restoration efforts. Now, one thing we do recommend to all of our customers, including our city, is that if there's an outage that you're experiencing, let us know. Call SCE for your residents. Have them call SCE, report it. They can they can even report it on the mobile app. Okay, very simple process. For our cities, there's another process where I'd like for you, instead of reach out the, uh, calling the 800 number, we do have a team that was created to support you in all things outage related, okay? And that's the outage communications team. And I'll give you more information about contact and all that later on, okay? So don't call the 800 number. There's a special bat phone, bat line for you. So that's, that's for you, okay? Now, a couple of common causes for repair outages. I'm not going to go into all of them, but I'll, call, I'll highlight just a couple of them. Uh, number one, fire, right? We're in the middle of it. We have a couple of fires going on. When fires are active in our service territory, we actually have an internal uh, fire team that actually goes out into the live fires to track what's happening and how our, our assets are located within that fire and how we can support fire crews uh, in their efforts. Okay, so that is an active thing happening. Another thing that happens for us, and you've heard me mention already a couple of times, is a car hitting a pole. This happens quite a bit. Uh, typically, it happens on Friday nights, uh, Super Bowl Sundays, things like that. That's when our poles get a little tipsy and jump out in front of cars. So that's a very, very common uh, re repair outage cause. Now, I know I'm kind of running out of time, so let me jump through this pretty quickly. Now, part of preparedness is really understanding what happens behind the scenes and what happens for on Edison's side on our process for an unplanned outage event, okay? Now, I did mention how our circuits have the capability to test themselves when the first 30 uh, seconds of an, uh, of an outage occurring. Now, within those 30 seconds, this is all done remotely. Our grid operations also begins to engage in that circuit or section of line that has been de-energized. So remotely, remotely, our grid operations will begin testing different sections of that circuit. Uh, the, our customers may experience that the, the power gets shut off and then turn back on, shut off and turn back on. Now, this happens quite a bit in, the, in those communities that have underground assets, right? So we're testing to isolate which areas are able to hold load and which are not. Okay, and as we continue with that, we'll start to further narrow down that fault location. During this time, we're also going to deploy our troublemen. Our troublemen are the boots in the field, and they're going to be the eyes in the field to let our grid ops know what they see in the field. It could be a, a tree that has fallen over some power lines or a tree branch, or maybe someone's backyard uh, umbrella has blown into overhead lines, which does happen quite a bit. So they'll, they'll be our eyes in, in the field and let us know what's happening, and they'll work with our grid ops center to switch uh, different sections of the community and restore customers as quickly as possible. Now, within the first 30 to 60 minutes of an unplanned event having begun, what we're doing behind the scenes is just data collecting, right? We're data collecting from our field crews. We're data collecting from our electrical assets, from alarms, including from our customers. Hey, Edison, I heard a loud boom in my, in my backyard and the power went out. All right, so we're data collecting. Now, why am I saying this? So one common question I do receive is I get a call from someone saying, hey, you know what, we just lost power about a minute ago. What's going on? How soon is my power gonna be restored? So just to level set with you, in the first 30 to approximately 60 minutes, we're data collecting. We're trying to find out what is happening, what was the cause, what, what was the trigger for the outage event, the scope, and how can we narrow that scope, right? How can we isolate that fault area? So just to let you know, again, let's go back to the rule of thumb. When the first 60 to 90 minutes of an unplanned outage event happening, we will have the majority of customers restored already. 
and only those customers that have to remain de-energized because we have to make the repairs will remain beyond that approximately 90 minute uh, mark, okay? Now, we will trigger notifications at about the 20 to 30 minute mark. Uh, at that point, there has been enough soak time that we know, okay, this area of customers are likely to be uh, remain de-energized for a longer period, so we're gonna push out notifications. Now, if we're able to restore them earlier than the 90 minute, great, we'll push out another notification within 20, 30 minutes that lets them know that power has been restored, okay? So that's in a nutshell how that happens, okay? So again, we recommend that our customers report their outage. Always please report it. You can do it via the app. Now, for all of my uh, major customers and government customers, how do I engage with SCE? when there's an unplanned outage event, okay? Reach out to the outage communications team. There are two ways to connect with us. You can reach out, well, actually, let me give you one way, because this is probably the best way. You can reach us at sceoutage at sce.com. That's sceoutage at sce.com. Now, it's an email address. You can reach out to our, our team, and they'll respond to you right away. Now, we do have someone on duty 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Right, we rotate a duty person, and that's our whole primary responsibility and role is to respond to your incoming injects. Okay, so anything if you experience an outage and you're not sure exactly where it is or have an idea, just reach out. Hey guys, we just we have an outage in uh, on first and main. I don't know what's happening. It was reported about you know 20 minutes ago, five minutes ago from a constituent. What's going on? Let us know what's happening. Now our team. Here's the difference between what our team can provide versus what the call center can provide. Now the call center does a great job of what they do. They provide a lot of broad information for our residential customers and typically that works out well. However, for our major uh, business customers and our government customers, we understand that you need a, a bit more of an in-depth analysis of what is happening in your community, right? What is really happening? And is the uh, ERT that we pushed out, estimated restoration time, how valid is that within the scope of your operations? So our team can provide that deeper uh, analysis for you, right? We can say, okay, it's actually between this street and that street. Uh, the fault is located in this area and our crews are actually, you know, isolating toward that one location. Uh, so we're looking at about another, you know, 40 minutes, you know, 60 minutes, whatever it is. So we can provide you more details. Now, because it's an email, you will have a history of, our, of engagement with SCE. So it makes it a lot easier to kind of uh, push that information to whomever needs to see it or et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Now we do have a phone number I can provide for you later on, but that phone number is really a message center. So you call that number and you'll leave a voice message. Now there is some lag time there between the, when the service provider delivers that voice message to us and us getting to it. So that's why my recommendation is always go with an email engagement with our outage team. Again, that's sceoutage at sce.com. Okay. Now we're adding a, a slide here with just some additional you know, just uh, links for uh, situational awareness and things like that, uh, mostly for informational purposes. If you need more or need additional or more specific details to your community, please let, let us know. Do you need something for access and functional needs? Do you need something for medical baseline customers, et cetera? We can provide that for you as well, okay? Now, I'm dropping this slide here just to give you an idea of what capabilities we have with our, our, our app. Uh, you can report an outage, look up an outage, et cetera. Very valuable information here. Now, just for information, uh, the app, uh, our outage map, is actually updated every 15 minutes. So if there's an outage that happened within 10, 15 minutes of, of it occurring, it may not necessarily reflect on the outage map yet, okay? There's about a 15-minute lag there, just to give you a heads up. And I think that brings me to conclusions. So let me just throw it back to you for any questions, comments, or if you just feel like killing an Edison guy today, I'm that guy. Well, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I'm actually the mayor for the city of Calabasas, and we have a upcoming meeting with Edison to discuss our dissatisfaction with what's been happening in our community. So everything that you presented in the presentation is great if it actually worked. <laughs> and if our power wasn't going out in such a large quantities in certain areas. So we've been working closely with Andrew and we look forward to meeting with your team to talk about the reliability. But I called that back number that was given to me and was not able to get a hold of anyone. And we'll go over that. I don't need to bore the whole cog with it, but our communities having issues that I've never heard of happening in communities throughout um, 
Southern California, or at least in Edison's area. But I appreciate what you guys are trying to accomplish. And I appreciate your willingness to come here today, and especially um, your willingness to meet with us. So hopefully we can find some resolution so that the power stays on in our community. Definitely looking forward to that conversation. Yes, thank you so much. Um, and thanks, Andrew, for your work with us and well, indulging me with all my calls. So Absolutely. if anyone else um, has any comments? Um, what is, what is the, yeah, what is the back number? Let me give that for you. I wrote it down. It's 855-683-9067. Thank why, don't you. You, why don't you repeat that, Lewis? That's 855-683-9067. Now, just know that this is an answering service. No one is going to pick that phone up live. You're not going to get to a live person. No, I know. I've left messages. and Yeah. So just to kind of level set with you. Uh, but an email is always the recommended method of engaging with the team. Does anyone else have any comments? And are you going to send us the PowerPoint? Yes, we can get that out to you guys. No problem. Yeah, and what, what's the email that we should use instead of calling in and leaving a message? That's sceoutage at sce.com. Let's see, I think, I, oh, there is a chat function. Let me do that. That's sceoutage at sce.com. And, and I think the last page of the slide, it has, uh, them that same information as well. I dropped them in the chat. Perfect. There we go. I think I did it right. You let me know. We can yes. see it. Okay, good, good. Thank good. you. Thank you so much for your time and your patience. Thank you. Um, have a good day, everyone. You too. Um, now we'll move on to our executive director's report. Thank you. Uh, just a, a few things that I'd like to highlight. Uh, first of all, uh, we on September 12th, we received our final letter from FEMA saying that uh, COGS hazard mitigation plan was approved, no strings attached or anything. So everybody's, uh, all the cities are eligible for any type of mitigation grants or anything else. So we're all good there. The uh, It's been uh, a busy month. It's been a busy month for the uh, COGS Fiber Project. Um, on August 20th, I participated in the Hidden Hills uh, Homeowners Association meeting to uh, provide uh, backup for Mayor Gold, making the presentation to the board with regard to the easements that are required to uh, construct the backbone of the fiber network through Hidden Hills. Uh, Mayor Gold uh, did a great job uh, explaining it to the board. Um, and I, I know that she and Council Member McCorkendale had done a lot of work in the background to uh, get the board comfortable with the project. And so uh, that went uh, without a hitch. So that was uh, a major win for the COG. And then um, let's see, we've been working on uh, something that we're going to be uh, voting on later, um, but there's been a lot of kind of last minute details that you might imagine that have come up on the design engineering uh, the past couple of months uh, with uh, not only our cities, but with the county. And so we're trying to work through those. Um, and uh, like I said, the last remaining item appears to be the signal um, designs, and those will be uh, voted on, hopefully, uh, by the board uh, later on under action items. Uh, the COGS Homeless Working Group met yesterday for uh, a discussion of... Uh, homeless issues in the COG area, and along with uh, participation by LASA, and they're gearing up for the, uh, it seems like they're always gearing up for the homeless count, but uh, that's in January. And uh, it was nice to have uh, Rob uh, from uh, Westlake on in, in place of Caleb. So uh, that was good. And 
And on homeless issues, I'm going to be making a presentation to the Westlake Public Safety Committee on Thursday. So, um, and if any other cities, you know, ever want me or Gabriel or both of us to attend uh, one of a, a similar meeting in a city, I'm happy to do that. Um, we do have, and this is something that the COG really um, doesn't hear about on a regular basis, but Metro has what they call service councils. And there are service councils in different regions of the LA County area. Uh, most of it um, aligns with the COGS. And uh, the San Fernando Valley uh, Service Council, uh, our appointee, Dennis Washburn, has been on there for probably seven years. We've had difficulty in the past finding a representative to serve on that, but uh, Dennis has indicated that he no longer wishes to serve, which uh, surprises me. I love Dennis, uh, but he said that it's just too much work for him to get to the meetings and driving at night and so forth. So the Metro Service Council uh, advises Metro on bus and other transportation related issues. Uh, the supervisors, uh, two of the supervisors have an appointee and um, it's kind of considered a plum appointment for lack of a better term. Although uh, I don't think our COG has ever looked at it that way, but uh, that's been what's reported back to me. So bottom line, we do have an opening. Um, somebody that either rides transit or is interested in uh, transit, bus lines, uh, so that kind of stuff uh, from our COG would, uh, would be great if we could uh, ask, or if I could ask for uh, each one of you to think about somebody from your community or somebody that you might know in the area that might be interested in serving on that, uh, that would be great. Uh, two other quick items. Um, Terry, the, real quick. Yeah. Terry, real quick. How often are the meetings? The meetings are once a month and they meet at the Marvin Browdy uh, community room or information center in Van Nuys. Oh, and okay. they're, they're in the evening at 6.30. Oh, great. Okay. Um, let's see. Just And this is just a, a quick item that I've shared with the uh, COGS um, Highway Working Group is that Metro is in the process of developing or encouraging the COGS to uh, develop or create some sort of public participation for uh, equity purposes to make sure that um, that any project that's brought forward that's being funded with Measure M goes through a process where there's a community survey, public workshop, uh, those kind of things. Metro wants to be sure that the community is involved and um, uh, I said to them, it's not like the the city engineer says, oh, I want to do this project and nobody's ever heard of it. And then and then the COG includes it. I said, it always goes through a very thorough process with each one of the cities before it even comes to the COG. But they, they still want some sort of, uh, for the COG to check the boxes to, to make sure we... Uh, we touch base on those. So that's the last thing. And then uh, some of you may know, but I just wanted to highlight that it was anticipated that Supervisor Horvath would come out and speak to the COG with regard to the board expansion and ethics measure that she uh, and the Board of Supervisors voted to put on the ballot. However, once it's on the ballot, the supervisors and county staff is prohibited from advocating so um, I could arrange a informational uh, presentation if you would like with uh, with county staff, but that's what's prohibiting Supervisor Horvath from attending and participating in the meeting. And uh, that concludes my report. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Does anyone have any questions for Terry? Thank you so much for the report. Now we will move on to city updates and I will start with Agora. 
Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Chair Weintraub. Um, just a couple quick updates for us. Our, uh, our annual Reyes Adobe Days is our big festival coming up, October 4th through 6th. Uh, we'll have the Night at the Adobe, which is a good night. Uh, local restaurants and uh, the brewery will be out uh, that evening. At uh, then the we also have our Ladyface Greenway project, which is underway on Agora Road. Um, we're really happy to get that um, moving along. We will be covering the channel um, that is owned by uh, Los Angeles County Flood Control um, and utilizing some of that water uh, with our diversion project that will eventually uh, hopefully connect with the Pure Water project. And then the final uh, project that we're working on of uh, note is our wildfire risk assessment. Uh, that is now underway. And uh, we received some good news that uh, we got an additional grant um, with the help of our local fire, fire safe council uh, to do the next step of the wildfire protection plan. So um, we'll have kind of step one and step two underway. Um, in the next six to nine months, we'll have all of that completed. And um, with that, I will uh, turn it over to Penny or Jeremy if you have anything to add. No, I have nothing to add. Thank you very much, Nate. Okay, now we'll move on to Calabasas. Kinden. Good morning, everybody. Um, happy to be with you. Just a, a couple updates from the city of Calabasas. Last week, we were notified that the city received a, approximately $1.3 million in federal funding for the Safe Streets for All program. So we're excited about that. That will help us develop some plans and other documents that will guide projects in the future, including pedestrian crossings, safe pedestrian crossings, bikeways, and other projects. So we're excited about that. And then just last week, the same day as the earthquake, um, our residents received our new, let me see if I can get a good picture of it, not showing through our new uh, um, emergency preparedness packet. So it arrived in uh, their mailboxes just a few hours after the earthquake. We timed that perfectly. Mm -hmm. We worked with Mother Nature on that one. But uh, <laughs> our staff has been working for several months on this one. We had an initial initial packet that went out in 2019. And so this is a really revised, updated packet that includes information on circuit awareness, PSPS events, QR codes that residents can scan to get more information and a Know Your Zone campaign. So we're excited to have that out. Alicia, anything else you'd like to add? Nope, you covered it. Thank you. And now I will turn over to Hidden Hills, Gloria and Aniko. Hi, I'd like to um, introduce our new interim city manager, Gloria Moyeda. Some of you already met her and know her. She has extensive decades long municipal experience. Um, she worked as the city manager of Rosemead and she also worked for San Gabriel and Alhambra. And I, I'm gonna say something short, but very important, she's a breath of fresh air in Hidden Hills. So we are super excited to have her on board. And Gloria, I'll turn this over to you now. Thank you, Mayor. You are very kind. I appreciate your comments. Um, I have met some, some of you already. Um, I just want to give a quick report regarding the Cogsmark City Regional Fiber Network. Um, I want to announce to everyone that Mayor Gold and Terry Dipple attended the HOA meeting last month. Um, the HOA, the HOA board has now committed to approving the necessary easements uh, to allow the COG to proceed with the fiber project. Fiber project. Um, so thank you, Mayor, for presenting to the HOA. Thank you, Terry, for attending the meeting and sending an, an appreciation letter to the HOA. I know they really appreciated that. Um, this weekend, we also had our Fiesta event, which was a success. We were very happy to host the city of Calabasas and the entire city council. And we were glad you guys were all there. Um, in addition, I was able to have dinner with Kinden and his family. I was able to sit down for a second and we actually broke bread. And so your family is very lovely, Kinden. So thank you again. Um, I'm not sure if you want to add anything else, Mayor. No, and ju I just want to say, if any of you attended and, and we didn't get to talk, uh, I'm sorry, but um, we'll see you next year. We have the date. So we'll be notifying everyone, everyone way in advance. Thank you. Thank you, Hidden Hills. And now we will turn to Malibu. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Weintraub. Uh, well, I have the... Uh, an unenviable position of having to report on fun things after they already happened. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we did have our annual chili cook-off uh, hosted by the Boys and Girls Club that was held over Labor Day weekend. 
Uh, it was a great event. Uh, and then this last weekend, we had our un annual public safety fair at City Hall. Uh, had some good attendance and, of course, trying to get everybody prepared and ready for fire season. Um, also, um, and, and thanks to uh, Andrew and folks from Edison here today, um, we actually had a, a little PSPS last Monday, uh, the week before, uh, in the middle of that freak heat and windstorm. Uh, fortunately, it was just a small area of Malibu that was affected, and they were able to get them uh, re-energized and back up next morning. Uh, but just, but definitely a reminder um, that we're heading into uh, heading into that time of the year. And then, of course, uh, the the big thing for Malibu, uh, we are eagerly awaiting. Uh, for the governor to sign SB 1297. Uh, this would establish and allow uh, speed cameras in the city of Malibu. We'll be putting in five systems. Uh, so we're waiting for the governor to sign that bill. Uh, and then we have a lot that we need to do on our end to, to get ready uh, to be able to move forward to implement that. Uh, but obviously very good news and we're very excited uh, and uh, anticipating the governor signing that any day soon here. Uh, also, um, uh, Senator uh, Stern's bill, 1509, the uh, negligent operator treatment, so which would add additional penalties for folks going, um, driving really fast, I think it's over 20 or 25 miles an hour, that also got approved and, and is waiting for the governor's signature. So a lot of good efforts right now going on in Malibu, uh, continuing to work with the folks at Caltrans um, on their Pacific Coast Highway uh, Master Feasibility Plan. Um, they're working with the community right now to get feedback on that, um, but really continuing to see some some great support and follow through from the state of California on trying to make some fundamental changes to, to, to Pacific Coast Highway. Uh, I think that's it for my report. Uh, I'll turn it over to Councilmember Grisanti, and I know our mayor is on as well if they have anything to add. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe... Then we also had our public safety event last Saturday that lasted all day. It was great. We had great participation from Southern California Edison, the fire department, the search and rescue, uh, the sheriff's department, all of the various agencies. It was really well attended. And uh, we I think we finally figured out how to advertise it correctly so that we get a lot of people. So looking forward to doing it again next year. Great. And last but not least, Westlake. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all. Um, things are things are great in Westlake Village. Uh, we had a, a nice council recess in August, um, but the council's back in session, had our first meeting last week. And a few of the things that we're working on um, is our annual street program. We try and keep up with all of our street works. We spend several million dollars on resurfacing streets every um, every year. So that's underway. We have an interesting uh, policy discussion on code enforcement. Westlake Village has had a long tradition and culture of a pretty light touch with respect to code enforcement, but there are times where uh, I think, as we all experience, you need to escalate enforcement. And um, so we're strengthening our code to be able to do that, but how exactly that gets deployed um, is something that we're trying to work through. Um, preparing for fire season. Of course, we're in that now. Um, Malibu had their safety fair on the weekend. So did uh, City of Thousand Oaks um, on Saturday with Jackie Irwin. We participated in that one, particularly because they're so close and border with us. So that was a um, really nice event as well. Um, on the more sort of fun activities, we finished up all our summer programs. Actually, we had our movie night this past weekend. And you might think, well, that's a bit late because summer's over, but we had to cancel the movie night twice. First time because the screen caught on fire. That hadn't happened before. And the second time it was um, the heat wave and it was like 100 degrees at six o'clock or something. But happy to say that Kung Fu Panda was shown this past weekend. Families are very happy about that. Um, pickleball courts continue to get built. We're a little bit behind, but we hope in October we'll be up and running and look forward to people playing pickleball up at our community park. So uh, that's it from Westlake Village. Thank you, Terry, for participating in advance on the Public Safety Committee meeting later this week. Appreciate that. And um, Kelly might have some things to add. I'm not sure. Kelly? Uh, I don't. I'm just trying to figure out how to get rid of the lake picture, but and <laughs> but I have not yet. But enjoy the lake. No, thanks, Rob. I have nothing. Thank you. Okay. 
Thank you. And I'm going to turn the meeting over to Penny for just a few minutes. <laughs> You're on mute, Penny. Penny, you're muted. Sorry, I'll start that again. So um, do we have any, we're going to move on to public safety, safety, legislative and agency partner updates. Is anybody from the Sheriff's Department here? They're probably preparing for the breakfast. Oh, yes, we do. Oh, good one. Good morning. How are you guys? Uh, for those of you I haven't met, uh, I'm Lieutenant Carr. I work uh, for uh, Captain C2. Uh, she had a little bit of a family emergency and so um she uh won't be in until um the interfaith meeting but yes we are preparing for the interfaith meeting downstairs um it begins in just uh just a little bit actually um so we do have that we have um members from our clergy um uh, the jewish federation so it's going to be a nice event so anyone that's coming please uh welcome to our station um few other things I know that there's a time constraint so one of the big things going on is on the 27th uh Friday September 27th we have our the opening of our real-time crime and disaster center it's our ribbon cutting ceremony the sheriff will be here um it's going to be a big event everybody's invited so we hope to see everybody here um it's very exciting um it's the first of its kind on our department and um the, we're hoping to have a big success on it Another exciting thing is last Wednesday, our drones finally got approved by the department. So um, we had a, um, I know a little while back, we had a sneak preview when we had a little mountain lion incident, but last night was the, uh, our inaugural flight that's been approved. And um, we had a vehicle that was reportedly over the side of the road on Canaan, uh, ended up not being there, but we were able to utilize the drone for, uh, for that purpose. And it worked out very well. And um, we're also working with Chief Drew Smith, again, on fire preparedness. That's a big topic for everybody. We actually sent out uh, Sergeant Wax, who is our fire liaison. Is, uh, he fills many roles on at our station right now. And uh, we sent him out to the bridge fire in the Antelope Valley uh, just to, to observe and to take notes and to assist if he, if he can. So, um, you know, we can always learn from every every single uh, major incident and and so um, we had him out there just taking notes. And then if you are here for the interfaith meeting, you'll see all our fire bags are in our briefing room right now. Um, we're ready to go. And uh, but right now we're enjoying the cooler, more humid weather. So thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have someone from the fire department? No. OK, moving on. Um, Sophia. Yes. Sophia, would you like to go? I would love to. Good morning, everybody. Um, Sophia Sudani here from Supervisor Horvath's office. Couple updates from us. It was great to see some of you at the Hidden Hills Parade. I know the supervisor very much enjoyed it. Um, it was also great to see Penny and some other uh, leaders at the Greater Conejo Valley uh, Boys and Girls Club Gala on Saturday. We've had a fun-filled weekend on this side of the hill. Um, just a couple updates as well from our office. October 5th, we're talking about emergency preparedness. We're doing um, an emergency preparedness event October 5th at the Getty. So we would love for you to join us. I know it's not too far for our Malibu residents. And, you know, any excuse to go down to the Getty, I don't think is a bad thing. So if you're interested and want to learn more, we'd love to have you. Um, on Sunday as well, we, are, we celebrated our Latino Heritage Month at a very big celebration in the Valley. And we're continuing to celebrate all month long. Um, we also had a commissioner's breakfast celebration earlier this month as well that um, we're recognizing some of the amazing commissioners that we have at SD3. Um, last update I do want to provide is Metro received a major boost in federal funding to the tune of $893 million towards the completion of the light rail line that will connect Van Nuys to Pacoima by 2031. So that was very exciting. The supervisor was there with some of our other state and federal representatives there to um Congrat to be to for the ribbon cutting of that, um, the check signing. So that was really exciting. And we're very excited for that development to occur. Um, those are all my updates from the office. The one thing I will also say in closing, I will be gone most of October. So starting October 9th, I will be away for the lot for the next three weeks. So if there's anything that you guys need from the city side, 
please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, I want to make sure everything is taken care of as best as possible before I leave. But um, if not, um, I have amazing colleagues that will be covering in my stead, but that's it for me. Thank you so much. And Do Penny, have- I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm back, but you can keep going if you want. Okay, no, no, you take over. I'm no, <laughs> Um, let's see who is next. Um, do we have a representative from CHP? Is Casey here? I don't see CHP. So we will move ahead to Cal City's monthly update, which is included in our agenda. But Jeff, would you like to highlight? Just wanted to uh, to touch base on a couple of things that are already there. Good to see everyone. Uh, obviously, the legislature is uh, closed for the year. We're working on all those uh, veto and sign letters to the governor's office. I uh, really want to shout out to and thank uh, Agura Hills for working so closely uh, with me on some of those letters. I've seen a lot of those come in from Agura, so that's wonderful. Um, just wanted to, to highlight the voting delegate form, which is included in my uh, report for the annual conference. Uh, we've received a voting delegate form from everyone uh, in this COG, except for the city of Hidden Hills. So, um, uh, Gloria, if, if anything needs uh, to be, if you need any help from me on that, just let me know. Uh, otherwise, uh, that deadline is still uh, not for a couple of weeks yet, so you've got a little time. And I wanted to also uh, make an announcement that uh, the LA County Division lunch at the annual conference on that Wednesday at 11.30 a.m. Um, we've actually changed our speaker. Uh, the state controller, Malia Cohen, uh, is going to be able to join us and be our featured speaker for that event. Um, I see a bunch of registrations from Calabasas, but if others are going to be attending the annual conference, uh, that's always a good place to start your conference experience. Uh, and then just to touch base on, um, we are working on um, the three uh, Cal City supported uh, propositions, uh, props four, five, and 36. And the LA County Division is going to be taking a look at uh, Measure A here in LA County um, next week when our board meet, uh, meets for that. So uh, if you have any input, uh, Laura McCorkendale is your this COG's representative, um, and hopefully she'll be able to be part of that conversation as well. Um, but that's all I have. If you have any questions for me, please uh, hit me up in the chat or let me know. Thank you so much, Jeff. I'm going to turn to Nick Robbins from Metro, who has an update. Oop. Good morning, everyone. I've got camera issues here coming from a side angle. Can everyone can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, I just want to let everyone know that we recently had a meeting with uh, Susan Duenas at Mal- from Malibu's uh, Public Safety Department concerning Metro's uh, evacuation procedure during uh, fire emergencies. And it was a really productive conversation. We were able to identify some specific uh, action points and uh, clarify for uh, the city of Malibu, how our mutual aid efforts can support uh, the city during fire evacuation. And I would be happy to arrange for a briefing for any of the COG cities here to discuss uh, how Metro can support uh, during any fire evacuation. Uh, so we, um, you know, not to spend too much time here, but please feel free to reach out to me and I will uh, coordinate a briefing for you. Thanks. I think that would be great. And I'm sure a lot of people will reach out for that. Thanks so much, Nick. Now we'll turn on to legislative staff updates. I'll turn to Nancy and then Kate. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to be quick. We too are waiting for the governor to sign bills. Eight of them are sitting on his desk and then also the Senate bill for the traffic lights. So we are anticipating some signatures soon. We do have five bills that have been signed, but we have talked about them. The biggest one or the one that's getting the most press is 1779, one of the package of crime bills for um, burglaries and robberies. And ours was working with the DA's office that they can do inter-jurisdictional when they are prosecuting. I think we've talked about that before. We too had our safety fair and it was the biggest and the best yet. 
We had over 40 organizations. We had a huge touch truck section, face painting. So I was just going to say for you Malibu folks, I've been doing this for 10 years now and we had well over 500 people come and it was lovely to see families come. Adding that element, usually it's people our ages that are there, but adding an element to pull in the families was great. Not only seeing those little three-year-olds in their fire hats with the big gloves and the hoses, but watching the parents gather information that they need as a family for evacuations, for fires, all of those kind of things. Um, we also had five presentations scheduled. Each one of those were full and it only went from 10 to one. They were half hour presentations. And there was, I think, 55, 60 chairs in the room and they were full each and every one of them, except the earthquake one because they had to cancel last minute. And of course we had two earthquakes. But Jackie is in town. She's taking meetings. She's going to events. She's here until they go back for swearing in after the election. Um, and reach out if you have anything, you want to make an appointment. We do have a form on our website for scheduling. But if you fill that out to have a meet with Jackie, let me know as well, because they've moved scheduling up to Sacramento. And sometimes things get bogged down in Sacramento, like you've never heard that before. And that's it for me. Thanks so much, Nancy. Kate? Hello, everyone. Um, I apologize if it gets noisy behind me. I'm in our Oxnard office, which is right by the train station. Um, so you might hear uh, a couple trains coming by. So I'm going to try and keep this quick. Um, we excuse me, uh, the Congresswoman presented uh, a number of different um, uh, money to different cities. Um, as I mentioned, I'm going to keep this quick, so I'm not going to mention all of that funding. Um, here she is currently in DC. The House is um, currently trying to pass a continuing resolution to keep the government funded. Uh, there is a possible government shutdown that is going to happen um, on September 30th. So kind of keep that in mind. Uh, it's going to be an interesting uh, couple of weeks. There are two events that are coming up for the Congresswoman that I'd like you to be aware of. Um, one of these is our Service Academy information nights. Um, we have a Zoom information night this coming Wednesday, and that's going to be um, due on the 18th at 5.30. And then our last information night for the Service Academies is going to be September 25th at Foothill um, High School in Ventura, and that's going to be at 5.30. If you know anyone that's interested in the Service Academies, please have them reach out to our office and I'm I'm the one taking lead on that. So always more than happy to provide information. Um, lastly, we have our passport fair coming up and that's going to be this coming Saturday, the 21st. Um, for information on that, please call our office. If you have any constituents that are looking to renew um, or get a passport, that is going, they're going to need an appointment to attend that event. And again, that's this coming Saturday and that's going to be from, nine to 2.30. That's it for me. There's a train coming, so I'm going to, to hop off. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect timing. Thanks so much, Kate. Now we are going to move on to our action items. The first action item is annual Measure M funding allocations. I would like to call on Terry to give his report on this item. Thank you, President Weintraub. As uh, all of you know, Annually, the COG allocates its Measure M funding. Um, and in the past, of course, um, we've funded our uh, fiber project. And we have uh, 5 million allocated for this current fiscal year and 5 million allocated for next fiscal year. However, with the um, expectation that the fiber project is going to be uh, 12 to $15 million project where I'm proposing to add three, $3 million from the COGS 25, a 26 allocation to that project, and then uh, allocate the remainder for 25, uh, 26 to the uh, COG cities and to the county, of course. And that's shown in the uh, staff report. 
And then um, also uh, we have 2627 allocations that have been uh, made available. And I've been working with the cities on both of those, uh, the allocations for both of those years. And I'd like to uh, quickly run through that uh, in the report. So as I said, uh, in addition to the, the 3 million that I'm proposing to add to the uh, fiber project, we're also reallocating 1.5 million from the Hidden Hills uh, project. So uh, that would be uh, 4.5 million for 25-26, uh, and, and that should get us through uh, the fiber project. Um, and then uh, with with respect to the individual cities uh, and all of this went to the city managers for a brief discussion earlier uh, and uh, everybody is on board. Um, so for Agoura Hills, uh, the two years allocation is 5.7 million and uh, Agoura is proposing to allocate uh, 2.4 million in 25-26 and then uh, reallocate uh, 1 million one from their Canaan Agura Road. Both of those would be allocated to the Lady Face Greenway project, uh, which they had the uh, groundbreaking uh, back in August that, that I attended. It's gonna be a very exciting project. And then uh, they're allocating the remainder of their 26, 27, which is 3.2 million for the Canaan Corridor project. Uh, Calabasas is has uh, six point four million, almost six point five, and that's um, going to be allocated to their Mulholland Gap closure project, which is a significant project for the, the city of Calabasas. And uh, then Hidden Hills allocation is uh, almost uh, five hundred thousand dollars, and that's proposed to be allocated to their. Long Valley project, and I attended the ribbon cutting for the uh, the gate project and uh, staging area parking lot the other day, which was really great. And then uh, Malibu has uh, some significant uh, uh, projects. They're proposing to allocate uh, their three point five million to their PCH signal synchronization project, that would be a million five for 2526. And then the PCH Lost Flores Canyon Road at Rambla Pacifica um, in 2627. Westlake is proposing to uh, allocate 1.1 million in uh, 2526 to their Lakeview Canyon complete street project. And then they had some funding that was uh, also uh, not allocated previously that was carried over. And that's how that number is 1.1. And then their regular allocation for 26-27 is 1.3 million, which is also proposed for that project. Uh, let's see. And then um, there's a, a new project, an ITS signal uh, project that will get uh, four and a half or 495,000 in 25, 26 to get that project underway. And lastly, um, the county uh, has a little over 5 million. Uh, there was previously when I presented this to the city managers in an informational meeting that we had, they had allocated that to two separate projects, but uh, in subsequent discussions with Supervisor Horvath's transportation deputy, um, they don't seem to be able to uh, make a decision right now. And so they're asking to carry that five point or that $5 million over to next year. And they hope to have uh, a better handle on how that money would be allocated. And that concludes my report on the Measure M allocations. I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, from the governing board. Does anyone have any questions for Terry? If there are not any questions, is there a motion? 
to approve the Measure M funding allocations? I'd like to make a motion that we approve the Measure M funding allocations. Penny Sylvester seconds. Roll call, please. Aniko Gold. Aye. Paul Grisanti. Aye. Kelly Honig. Aye. Penny Sylvester. Aye. President Weintraub. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Wonderful. Thanks, Terry. Now we're going to move on to action item number two, which is the homeless grant amendment. I would like to call on Terry to give his report on this item. Yes, as uh, we've previously discussed, um, the COG had unallocated uh, homeless grant funds, and there was a uh, a desire to increase the COG's um, outreach coordinator to uh, provide more of a living wage for him. And so I'm proposing to increase that uh, by $10,000. And um, and then the uh, that's obviously very important. Uh, the other important item is that, um, as the governing board knows, we use uh, homeless grant funds to reserve four beds at the People Concern for individuals that they're working with in the city of Malibu. And we've been doing that now for a couple of years, and that program seems to be going very well. Um, but we've been looking for an opportunity in the uh, the spa two area, which is the other four cog cities to have a similar uh, option in case there are uh, unhoused individuals that are uh, looking for shelter that um, that Gabriel is working with. And the city of Calabasas has had a contract with the uh, San Fernando Valley Community Mental, Mental Health Center for the past year for one bed. And, um, and I suggested to uh, President Weintraub and to Kinden and to Michael McConville, uh, the uh, assistant uh, city manager, to uh, that the COG could absorb that with our unallocated uh, homeless grant fundings. And that way, uh, Calabasas wouldn't have to pay for it. And it was uh, recommended in discussing it with the city managers that instead of just one bed, we go to two beds. That way there would be two beds available for um, any uh, unhoused individuals that Gabriel is working with uh, along the 101 in the, the other four COG cities. So hopefully, um, that meets with your approval. Uh, the county was pleased to hear that we were uh, reserving the two beds at the mental health center. And um, so I, I think that um, it, it puts us in really good position to address homelessness on in all five of our COG cities. So uh, my recommendation is to uh, approve those two items as the amendment to the uh, Cogs Homeless Grant. Thanks, Terry. And I just wanted to add, um, Gabriel's more than deserving of anything more that we can do to um, show our support for your work. And also that the San Fernando Valley Mental Health Clinic, it's an incredible center. So if anyone has an opportunity to visit they do so much for the people that um, they serve. So I'm really happy that we can increase our regional contract with them. That's a motion. I'll second it. <laughs> <laughs> Roll call, please. Aniko Gold. Aye. Paul Grisanti. Aye. Kelly Honig. Aye. Penny Sylvester. Aye. President Weintraub? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Great. And then the last item is, where are we? Action item regarding the regional smart, smart cities fiber network change order. And I'd like to call on Terry. Yes. Um, 
the change order for the fiber design project came up over the summer when we were having meetings. And uh, just to briefly explain, the, the design engineering contract that we entered into provided design engineering um, for the, the entire project. The one thing that was not included was a, um, a design to the individual signal boxes um, in the project. And of course, you know, one of the major components of this project uh, is to synchronize signals. And it seemed to me that we didn't want to have a, a set of construction drawings that would require change orders for each individual signal. Uh, it seemed like that would be a lot of work for a city staff. It would be extra, it would be expensive and so forth. And uh, I checked with Metro. Metro said that uh, that we could, of course, use the Measure M funds for that project. And uh, we don't need we don't need to uh, do a design for all sixty six signals that are in the project because Malibu uh, is doing a separate uh, project that would then be uh, that would synchronize their signals would be separate from this project. And then, um, Calabasas uh, did not require the additional work because their signals have previously been updated. So, um, and the uh, the remaining signals are in Agura, Westlake, and the one that's at the intersection of, um, oh, I can, uh, wow. Round Meadow School, wow. yeah, yeah, Muro and and Round Meadow School. So those are the uh, the signals that would be included in this change order. It's uh, the total amount is twenty two thousand, and uh, it would be covered with Measure M funding. So uh, my recommendation would be to approve this uh, change order and uh, allow the signals to be included in the design engineering. So that concludes my report. Is there a motion and a second? I'd like to make a motion that we include the necessary funds in the change order. Any Great. Roll call, please. Aniko Gold. Aye. Uh, Paul Grisanti. Aye. Kelly Honig. Aye. Penny Sylvester. Aye. President Weintraub? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. That concludes my report. Are there any comments or requests for future agenda items? With that, um, the TAC will be meeting on Wednesday, October 2nd, and the governing board will be meeting on Tuesday, October 15th. And now we will adjourn our meeting. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye.